Righty, tighty, lefty, righty, nah, whatever. My name is Matthew and today we're going to talk about some of the weird pressure flow stuff you run into when you got like an LS pump and you're going to either an aftermarket or a retrofit rack and pinion into whatever you're swapping into. So let's dig into that. First things first is to figure out what pump you actually have. I'm going to lump all the truck motors together in with LS. The 485360 and all the variations in between basically use the same pump. I will refer to them as the P-series pumps and that's what I'm most familiar with because I've caused the most problems with them. You can see that the car-based pumps all put out uh, a good chunk less pressure and flow. But then when you get to the truck pumps, uh, they output quite a bit of flow and they output some pretty aggressive pressures. There's nothing wrong with that really, but if you try to connect pretty much any LS pump to a, let's say, a flaming river rack and pinion, you're gonna have some nasty problems. The rack and pinions use a piston to move back and forth, and there's some seals in there, so you're gonna have some nasty issues if it's trying to shove fluid in this side of the piston, and 300 PSI weeps over to the other side and tries to fill it, it likes to break things. And if you're gonna spend a lot of money on a conversion rack and pinion, the first thing you should do is not blow it up. That's what you have me to do for you, and I've done it, so don't do it. The next thing you need to worry about is your flow. And I say worry about it loosely. If you're doing like a 5.3 LS swap into like a 60s C10 or 70s C10, I really wouldn't worry about it, especially if you're going with a gearbox rather than a rack and pinion. It will flow a little bit more than the gearbox once, but it doesn't really matter. In my personal experience, an overpressurized gearbox will make the steering very jittery. And it's sometimes easier to see that when the vehicle is sitting still and you have someone move it, rather than when you're actually driving it. Because a lot of big old vehicles with some thick meaty tires won't, you know, it'll kind of absorb all that nonsense and you won't feel it. If you were swapping an LS53 into let's say an RX8 or a Miata, possibly like a Fox body Mustang, you're going to run into the flow and the pressure being way too high for the car. It'll start making it really jittery because it's pushing pressure on both sides. And it could have so much flow that when you move, it's just gonna whip the tires over there because it's moving so much fluid so fast. The fix is one of these puppies. This is a Borgensen pressure reducing kit. Another company makes them like Speedy Gonzalez Incorporated or Speedzilla 2049. But they're basically just a ripoff of each other. But let's be real, this is also kind of ripoff because it's basically for specifically fit washers that I'm sure they just found in a parts bin happen to fit and a aluminum spacer that's been cut so it acts as a vice clamp. This is the pressure and flow control setup from basically any Saginaw and LS series pump made by Chevrolet. They have some variations here I've seen over the years, but they all basically work like this. The most common variation I see is the length of this guy and the actual diameter of the hole in here. You can get replacement flow valves from a couple different companies. CPP makes a cheap Chinese one that works actually really well for dialing the truck pumps down just a little bit on its orifice size. KRC is a very cool company that can help guide you to the exact diameter you need to get it to whatever flow you need. They are a little bit pricier, but they are a really good part and the people there know what they are talking about. I've bought in a few over the years when we get really strange swamps. They do good work. To get the flow control valve out on easy mode, grab a one inch socket. That way you won't have to try to fit a wrench in the back of your pump to try to get this out in between all your bracketry and headers and all that fun stuff. This is where you're actually going to be adjusting the pressure. By emplacing several washers underneath this guy, you are going to effectively lower the overall pressure of your system. The last part of this is a spring. Nothing too crazy, but I would recommend hooking it on here first and shoving it into your pump as an assembly. Once you've got it into the pump housing, shove it in there a couple times to make sure it pushes back and forth freely. If this gets stuck in the bore of your power steering pump, it'll usually make it feel like you don't have any power steering at all. And it's more common than you expect. So take your aluminum bench flow valve crimpy thing you do, Dad, and your actual plunger and slide them get in there together. Carefully clamp it into a vise just tight enough to hold her still, but not actually destroy the whole process. Take your universal wrench twirler and uh, twirl your wrench. As you're pulling this out, remember there's a spring, a little rod that looks like a nail, and a little BB in there. So be sure not to immediately drop all that on the floor because it's basically gone then. All right. 
Now that you've twirled some wrenches up, be sure to blow this out backwards with some brake cleaner because it's got a very, very thin mesh in here to kind of work as a crappy filter. Here's the spring, nail looking thing, and the BB that goes inside of that little flow control valve. The spring is beehived, so there's really no wrong way to put it in. Just go ahead and clean off all these guys and the housing with brake clean and you're good to put it back together. Nothing like the smell of brake cleaner in the morning or 10 a.m. or whatever time it is. This is what it should look like inside your flow control valve before you put it back together. Now we can put the shims onto the bolt head and screw it in. Here is the heart and soul of the Borgensen pressure reduction kit. Um, five washers. So, well they call them shims, but let's be real. That's five washers that they figured out the perfect diameter for. According to the Borgensen manual, it says no shims equals 1350 PSI. I agree with that for the truck pumps, ah, sort of on the car stuff but I would agree that they're in the same basic ballpark. We need to go down to 850 PSI because that's what Flaming River says won't explode. One. Dose. Trace. Audi Quattro. Audi Quattro. We're putting four shims on here because that'll get us right at 850 PSI and I think that's where we need to be. Now we can throw this thing back in the clamp. Clamp it back in the clamp. And then we can take your universal clamp and start twirling your clamp. Oh, easy, easy camera, easy camera. Perfect. There's a torque spec you need to follow for this. Click, click. There, you're good to go. Inspect your cylinder to make sure you didn't put any marks in it. This one looks really good, and that's why you basically buy that kit is for that little spacer. And that's all there is to it. Throw it back together in the exact same way you took it apart, and it's basically not gonna explode, unless it does. If I'm leaving something out, or you've got a really good configuration that is a mishmash of, a meshment of different parts, I wanna hear about it. I bet other people wanna hear about it too, because there are so many different variations with this stuff, it's hard to figure out. A lot of this stuff I've figured out over the years by actually making horrifying mistakes. Either way though, you guys have a good one.